Uh, hey everyone, uh, if you haven't found a seat yet, please uh, come on in and grab a seat. Um, uh, my name is Caleb, uh, and whether you're here in the room, whether you're in your own living room, uh, welcome to Night Church. A particularly warm welcome if this is your first time with us as well. Uh, whether you're checking out what church is like or investigating the claims of Jesus, uh, we're so glad that you are here with us tonight. And the reason why we're glad is because we want the whole world, we want everyone to come to know Jesus. Uh, we want everyone to start a relationship uh, with the living God, with the God who is holy and righteous and perfect. Uh, that's not what we're like. Uh, Romans uh, chapter 3 says, There is no one righteous, not even one. There is no one who understands. There is no one who seeks God. All have turned away. They have together become worthless. There is no one who does good, not even one. It's pretty emphatic. Uh, who meets God's perfect standard? No one. Not even one. None of us. And so, as we gather here together, it is right that we start uh, by confessing our sin. And so that's what we're going to do together. We're going to start uh, by confessing our sin to God and putting our trust in him who can forgive us. And so the confession is um, up on the screen. Uh, please join with me as we do this. Merciful God, our maker and our judge, we have sinned against you in thought, word and deed. We have not loved you with our whole heart. We have not loved our neighbor as ourselves. We repent and are sorry for all our sins. Father, forgive us. Strengthen us to love and obey you in newness of life. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. Our Psalm 103 says, As far as the east is from the west, so far has he removed our transgressions from us. Uh, if you have confessed your sins and put your faith in Jesus, he has dealt with them completely. He has totally and utterly removed your sin from you. In God's sight, you are holy and righteous, and you can now have a relationship with him, the holy and righteous God, and that is just an incredible thing. And we are going to exercise this relationship that we can have with him now as we pray. So would you please join me as we pray? Father, we thank you for Jesus. Thank you that he took the penalty of death for our sin and that through him we can have a relationship with you. We pray that tonight we would grow in that relationship, that we would hear you speak, that we would know you better and that we would love you more. And we pray all of this in the name of Jesus. Amen. Uh, we have an interview tonight. So can I invite Matthew up? Fantastic. Uh, Matthew is uh, one of the kids' leaders at St. Paul's. Do you want... Nice. Um, so we just thought we'd get him up and we'd ask some questions and see what's happening in that space. So thank you for coming on. You're welcome. Uh, first question. So you lead kids at St. Paul's. What's that been like with COVID? Well, um, first half of the year particularly was very difficult. Uh, we had to do Ignite over Zoom and... Oh, yeah, okay. <laughs> well, <laughs> first half of the year was very difficult. We had to do fireworks over Zoom. Sorry, uh, we had to do Ignite over Zoom, and fireworks um, consisted mostly of short videos that we would take turns making and send to the kids. Um, recently, the restrictions have started to ease, praise God. Um, we're not quite back to normal yet, but we have a lot more freedom. And um, we're still having to alternate uh, with North Rocks, which means fireworks is only once every two weeks instead of once a week. Um, but Ignite has um, recovered well. Um, and at the moment, you're doing St. Paul's Kids. Can you tell us what is that and what's involved with that? So... Uh, St. Paul's Kids is a half-hour video we make every week um, to sort of substitute fireworks. 
uh, on the weeks where kids aren't able to come. And um, most of the work, I would say, is done by Mike, who writes these scripts. Um, we show up uh, some, we invite kids along, and they, they act out the, uh, the, the passage most of the time, and um, they do a game. Uh, the other week we did Hungry Hippos, but sort of in real life, we put the kids on trolleys, and um, I think I can still see the marks we made on the carpet. But um, it was good fun. Um, so we, uh, we do a memory verse. We do a, a lot of the stuff you would usually expect in, you know, a, sort of at fireworks. And um, then people edit it, um, obviously. <laughs> um, I personally get to work with one of the puppets. His name is Benny. Um, and he's, he's, he's really great. I love him. Um, and um, yeah, I mean, it's, it's, it's basically like a, a TV show. You know, we're making half hour of Bible-based content every week for these kids. Uh, so kids at St. Paul's didn't used to look like a TV show. Um, but that's what it does now. That's what it looks like to serve God's people at the moment and to look after these kids, to share the gospel with them. Um, what can we be praying for kids at St. Paul's at the moment? Well, obviously, we're hoping we don't have to do this forever. Um, so we would love prayer that the, um, you know, the virus would just go away, I guess, that we'd find a vaccine quickly and um, that we'd be able to get back to normal as soon as possible. Uh, and, you know, I guess we'd love prayer for the same things we always ask prayer for, that we'd be faithfully teaching the word and that the children would be growing as faithful servants in Christ. Yeah, thank you so much. Um, Sophie will be coming up to pray for those things a little bit later tonight, but thank you very much. Cool. You want yeah. to take that? That's fine there. Cool. Thank you, Dave. Ah, fantastic. All right. Um, the next thing that we're doing now is the best thing that we're going to do tonight, which is we're going to read the Word of God. We're going to read the Bible. So I'll invite Margaret up. Um, yeah. Every week we read the Bible because we believe that it is the Word of God, that it's the way that He speaks to us. And so that's what we're going to do now. Before Margaret reads, I'll just pray for us and our time in the Word. So please uh, join me in prayer. Our Father, you have said that all Scripture is God-breathed, that it is useful for teaching, rebuking, correcting, and training in righteousness, so that the servant of God may be thoroughly equipped for every good work. May your word be used for what it is useful for tonight. Teach, rebuke, correct, and train us in righteousness so that we would serve you. In Jesus' name, amen. Thanks, Caleb. I'm going to be reading from um, Matthew chapter 12, verses 22 to 50. So I'll give you a moment to open. Oh, it looks like you're actually doing really well with getting your Bibles open, so I'll head into it. Matthew chapter 12. Then they brought him a demon-possessed man who was blind and mute, and Jesus healed him so he could both talk and see. All the people were astonished and said, Could this be the son of David? But when the Pharisees heard this, they said, It is only by Beelzebul, the prince of demons, that this fellow drives out demons. Jesus knew their thoughts and said to them, Every kingdom divided against itself will be ruined, and every city or household divided against itself will not stand. If Satan drives out Satan, he is divided against himself. How then can his kingdom stand? And if I drive out demons by Beelzebul, by whom do your people drive them out? So then, they will be your judges. But if it is by the Spirit of God that I drive out demons, then the kingdom of God has come upon you. Or again, how can anyone enter a strong man's house and carry off his possessions unless he first ties up the strong man? Then he can plunder his house. Whoever is not with me is against me, and whoever does not gather with me scatters. And so I tell you, every kind of sin and slander can be forgiven, but blasphemy against the Spirit will not be forgiven. Anyone who speaks a word against the Son of Man will be forgiven, but anyone who speaks against the Holy Spirit will not be forgiven, either in this age or in the age to come. Make a tree good, and its fruit will be good. Or make a tree bad, and its fruit will be bad, for a tree is recognised by its fruit. 
You brood of vipers, how can you who are evil say anything good? For the mouth speaks what the heart is full of. A good man brings good things out of the good stored up in him, and an evil man brings evil things out of the evil stored up in him. But I tell you that everyone will have to give account on the day of judgment for every empty word they have spoken. For by your words you will be acquitted, and by your words you will be condemned. Then some of the Pharisees and teachers of the law said to him, Teacher, we want to see a sign from you. He answered, A wicked and adulterous generation asks for a sign, but none will be given it except the sign of the prophet Jonah. For as Jonah was three days and three nights in the belly of a huge fish, so the Son of Man will be three days and three nights in the heart of the earth. The men of Nineveh will stand up at the judgment with this generation and condemn it, for they repented at the preaching of Jonah, and now something greater than Jonah is here. The Queen of the South will rise at the judgment of, with this generation and condemn it, for she came from the ends of the earth to listen to Solomon's wisdom, and now something greater than Solomon is here. When an impure spirit comes out of a person, it goes through arid places seeking rest and does not find it. Then it says, I will return to the house I left. When it arrives, it finds the house unoccupied, swept clean and put in order. Then it goes and takes with it seven other spirits more wicked than itself, and they go in and live there. And the final condition of that person is worse than the first. This is how it will be with this wicked generation. While Jesus was still talking to the crowd, his mother and brothers stood outside wanting to speak with him. Someone told him, your mother and brothers are standing outside wanting to speak to you. He replied to him, who is my mother and who are my brothers? Pointing to his disciples, he said, Here are my mothers and my brothers, for whoever does the will of my Father in heaven is my brother and sister and mother. Good evening, everybody. Wonderful to be with you tonight. My name is Jack. I'm one of the pastors here. Hello to those in the room. Hello to those joining us online. It is good to be with you. When it comes to how you respond to the man Jesus Christ, it seems like there's really no shortage of options. You can believe that Jesus is the Lord of heaven and earth. You can believe that he never even existed. And there are plenty of options in between. Consider the, the casual acquaintance option. I think of an old friend of mine who's not a Christian who used to get really excited about wearing his Jesus is my homeboy t-shirt. He particularly liked wearing it around me. There's something very uh, Australian about that kind of familiar mateship with Jesus. You know, yeah, old mate Jesus, love that guy. He's so nice, so kind to everyone, full of love and peace. I mean, who wouldn't get on board with that? I haven't thought much more about him, but I'm sure he's on my side. You know, he's a top bloke. There's the kind of vague disinterest response. I remember one time near Easter a few years ago, I was walking around Epping Station just trying to meet random people and ask them what they thought about Jesus' resurrection. And I was astonished at how many people, person after person, saying, yeah, I'm, I'm pretty sure Jesus rose from the dead, but no, no, I, I'm not really interested in hearing any more about that. that. That doesn't sound particularly amazing or anything. How do people think that? I don't know. But there are all sorts of ways that you could respond to Jesus. And our pluralistic world looks at all those options and says, look, all opinions are equally valid. Who really knows? You make up your own mind and believe whatever you want. So for our world to look at the part of the Bible that we are looking at tonight, Matthew chapter 12, and see the different responses to Jesus here, it is shocking to see the exclusivity with which Jesus himself sees these options. Because for Jesus, there's no spectrum of opinions. It's completely black and white. There's no shades of gray at all. Look at what he says, chapter 12, verse 30. Whoever is not with me is against me. The kingdom of God which Jesus came to bring is divisive. And in the end, there's no sitting on the fence when it comes to Jesus. He demands a response from us. And a passage like the one before us invites all of us to consider, are you with Jesus or against him? It'd be great to have your Bible open to Matthew chapter 12 so you can see God's word for yourself. Worth noting, I'm only covering really up to verses 37 now. 
does stacks even just in that? But if, if you have questions about the rest of the chapter, feel free to send them through to the text line. If you have any other questions about what comes up tonight, send them through and we'll tackle a few in Q&A later on. And you can find an outline of where we're going on the St. Paul's website if that would help you as well. But let's get into it. We're talking about responses to Jesus. We're going to start by seeing the responses to Jesus, which are here in this part of Matthew. And that's bigger than just that passage tonight. It's worth noting in the structure of Matthew's gospel, we're up to this whole section, which is all about how different people respond. Chapters 11 and 12, we see lots of different responses to Jesus. And they're primarily negative responses. This section is part of the rising opposition that Jesus' ministry provoked. So in chapter 11, you see things like there are whole towns of people who refuse to respond to Jesus and repent. You see even someone as great as John the Baptist start to doubt Jesus' credentials. Last week, the start of chapter 12, you see how the Pharisees, the Jewish leaders, are now so angry against Jesus, they, they plot to kill him. The opposition, the temperature, if you like, is rising. And in our passage today, it rises to new heights because people start off asking this very pointed question. Is Jesus the son of David or the son of the devil? See how the scene opens. It starts with Jesus performing a miracle. He casts out this demon. Look at verse 22 with me. Then they brought him a demon-possessed man who was blind and mute, and Jesus healed him so that he could both talk and see. One of the most surprising things is how little airtime the miracle itself receives. It's it's summarized very quickly for us. We don't get any details because Matthew is much much more interested to tell us about what comes afterwards, the controversy that is provoked by this miracle. And we go straight there. So on one side of this controversy, you have most of the people, verse 23, the people who watch Jesus do this, and they're astonished, and they ask, could this be the son of David? Son of David, back in the Old Testament, in 2 Samuel chapter 7, God promised Israel's great King David, the one of his descendants would sit on God's throne forever. And based on their scriptures, the Jewish people were expecting this Messiah, this anointed King, to come and to perform wondrous, miraculous signs when he came with, with God's authority. So the crowds, they see Jesus cast out this demon and think, is this it? Is this the guy? Is he here? That's one side of the controversy. On the other side, we have our old friends, the Pharisees, and they don't buy it at all. They say Jesus hasn't come from God. What are you talking about? It's the exact opposite. They say he's come from the devil. Verse 24, when the Pharisees heard this, they said, it is only by Beelzebul, the prince of demons, that this fellow drives out demons. Beelzebul is this Old Testament false god name, and the Pharisees take that name and use it to refer to the prince of the demons, Satan the devil, God's great spiritual enemy. So right away we see this is not a light accusation that the Pharisees bring against Jesus. They're saying not only is he not the Messiah, the only reason he has these miraculous powers is because he has been given them by the devil himself. I don't know if you've seen one of those old movies where the character goes to the dusty crossroads at midnight and there's this you know, red, horny devil guy and they sign the contract in blood and hand over their soul for some sort of magical power. The Pharisees are saying, Jesus has done that kind of thing. He's not on God's side. He is sold out to the evil one. And the fact that the Pharisees respond to Jesus this way is really interesting. Particularly if you're a little bit on the skeptical side, perhaps. You find it hard to believe that Jesus did miracles at all? If that's what you think, it's great to have you here. If Jesus was just a big phony, just a a con man, you'd think the easiest way for the Pharisees to shut him down would just be to say, look, obviously he didn't really drive out a demon. This is just a trick. He's just a charlatan. And then you find a way to expose his supposed miracles as a fraud. But the Pharisees don't even attempt that. They are his most bitter enemies, and they don't even try to discredit the miracle itself Assumably because they couldn't. The fact that Jesus performed miraculous healings was incontrovertible. It was plain for everyone to see. And so the Pharisees don't dispute that Jesus is powerful. What they dispute is the source of that power. The kind of argument they're making, it's like, you know, if Jesus was a car, they can't deny the engine's running, so all they can do is say, well, what kind of fuel is this car running on? Is it divine diesel or unholy unleaded? I don't have anything against unleaded or anything, but I like alliteration, you know. Son of David or son of the devil? That's the question. That's the conflict that's set up between these two responses to Jesus. So what does Jesus have to say? 
We're now going to see Jesus' response to the responses. This is the response by Jesus. And Jesus responds at length. He has a lot to say. It's a response that comes in three parts. And in the first part, we see how Jesus responds directly to the accusation in front of him. Jesus says he's not on the devil's side. Rather, his miracles show the truth that he has come to bring God's kingdom. So let's see that. Jesus starts off by refuting the Pharisees' accusation by saying it just doesn't make sense, even on a basic level of logic. Verse 25, Jesus knew their thoughts and said to them, Every kingdom divided against itself will be ruined, and every city or household divided against itself will not stand. If Satan drives out Satan, he is divided against himself. How then can his kingdom stand? And if I drive out demons by Beelzebul, by whom do your people drive them out? So then they will be your judges. So what's wrong with saying that Jesus casts out demons by the prince of demons? Well, for starters, Satan is smart enough to know the old saying, united we stand, divided we fall. Any group that succumbs to internal squabbling and infighting won't be strong enough to face up to their opponents. Think if you've got who Satan is trying to face up to. His opponent is God himself. Why would Satan use Jesus to drive out his own demons? That's just a a terrible strategic play for him. And in verse 27, some of the Pharisees themselves were driving out demons. Does that mean that they're on Satan's side as well? So the Pharisees, they can't accuse Jesus without throwing their own people under the bus. Their accusation is ultimately self-defeating. It fails just on the level of internal coherence. So after shutting the Pharisees down, showing them to be wrong, Jesus doesn't leave them there. He goes on to say, well, what is the right understanding of what's just happened? Because Jesus is no mere man. There is a spiritual power at work in him. But it's not an evil spirit. It is God's own Holy Spirit. Verse 28, Jesus says, But if it is by the Spirit of God that I drive out demons, then the kingdom of God has come upon you. He says, You want to know what fuel my engine's running on? I'm empowered by the Holy Spirit. And this is in line with the picture that Matthew has been painting all along in his gospel. Back in Matthew chapter 3, Jesus is baptized. The Spirit of God descends on him from heaven like a dove, and it rests on Jesus. And we saw just last week, Matthew chapter 12, verse 18. Jesus' ministry fulfills this prophecy from Isaiah that God would send a servant with his Holy Spirit on him. Have a look, just a few verses up. 12, 18. Here is my servant whom I have chosen, the one I love in whom I delight, I will put my spirit on him, and he will proclaim justice to the nations. Matthew's saying, you want to understand who Jesus is? This is it. He is the Lord's servant, anointed with the spirit. That is, he's had the Holy Spirit poured out upon him. So the Holy Spirit and Jesus go together hand in glove. That's why Jesus can cast out demons, not because he's powerful from Satan. It's the power of the Holy Spirit, the power of God himself. And according to Jesus, that has a massive implication. It means that the kingdom of God is here. So he says, verse 28, the kingdom of God has come upon you. The kingdom of God is this huge phrase across the New Testament. It's all about the establishment of God's rule as the rightful king of the world. And Jesus says here, the kingdom has come. It's here already. As Jesus roams around the countryside of Galilee, teaching people, healing people, God's kingdom is not this far off, one day, maybe pie in the sky kind of thing. Jesus says it's now. The kingdom is breaking in. It's here. As he goes around casting out demons, the first shafts of the kingdom's light are breaking in through the clouds of darkness. And to help us get this and and, and track with this, Jesus illustrates a little further with the little picture of robbing the strong man. Verse 29. Or again... How can anyone enter a strong man's house and carry off his possessions unless he first ties up the strong man? Then he can plunder his house. It does seem kind of funny to picture Jesus as the robber, but that's the illustration he gives us. And it's a straightforward point. If you're going to rob a strong man, you better tie him up first. You know, take our favorite St. Paul's strong man, Mike Everett. If you're going to go and break into Mike's house, I don't recommend that, by the way. Like, that, that's not a suggestion. But if you do... 
you better find some way to incapacitate them, right? If you just let Mike roam free and try and run for this stuff, I don't think it's going to end well for you. In the same way, Jesus is like the robber who has come into the world to tie up the strong man, Satan. Jesus is going about driving out Satan's demons, beating him back. He's, he's handcuffing Satan. He's incapacitating him. And why? So he can rob him. So that he can steal away all those people trapped under Satan's tyranny and bring them into a kingdom of his own. And friends, this is the wonderful good news that this passage has for us. Because this is about us. You and me, we are by nature sinners trapped under Satan's tyrannous rule, powerless to escape. But Jesus has come to break Satan's power, to overthrow his kingdom. He's come to rescue us out of this dominion of darkness and bring us into the kingdom of his own. That's the good news here for us. And I fear that the good news from a passage like this can often be lost on us today because we modern, enlightened Westerners find it pretty hard to take the idea of Satan seriously at all. Maybe you feel a little bit embarrassed almost about these demon and devil passages in the Bible. As a modern person, it all feels perhaps a little bit ridiculous. I've felt my fair share of that in the past. But we need to shake off that worldly skepticism and follow Jesus' example here, because he certainly didn't scoff at the devil. He took him seriously. It's not foolish to believe in demons. It's foolish to underestimate their power. Look at how this passage describes Satan. Look at what Jesus says. He has a kingdom. He's called the strong man. Jesus doesn't assume him to be an idle, empty threat. He assumes Satan has actual power. As the apostle Peter put it, the devil prowls around like a roaring lion looking for someone to devour. And I take it when it comes to it, we do believe in the devil because at times we'll all feel the sting of that power. We, we feel the attacks of the devil. Perhaps it's that, that little whisper in the head that says, this time you've blown it. There's no way you're coming back. That, that sin was, was terrible. How could you do that? How could God possibly let you come back after that? You're through. And in those moments when we feel the devil's attacks, the answer is not for us to listen to our world and scoff at Satan and laugh him off and pretend he doesn't exist. Now the answer is to remember that he is powerful, but there is someone with a greater power than Satan. The answer is to remember that our Lord Jesus has come to bind the strong man and to snatch you from his grasp. And we can hold dear words like these ones from the hymn we're going to hear a little later on. Before the throne of God, it says, when Satan tempts me to despair, and tells me of the guilt within, what do I do? Upward I look and see him there who made an end of all my sin. We need not fear the devil, nor succumb to the power of his attacks, because we have a greater king who has come to make us his own. That's the first part of Jesus' Jesus's response. He is not driving out demons by the prince of demons. Jesus is God's spirit-empowered king who has come to drive out the prince of demons, to bind him, to bring in the kingdom of God. And moving on, what does the Pharisees' accusation tell us now about the Pharisees themselves? Because that's where Jesus goes next. Jesus goes on to say that there is a way to respond to the kingdom that he has brought, which is wrong. And not only wrong, but unforgivable. And he calls it blasphemy against the Spirit. Jesus wants the Pharisees, firstly, to be clear that there's no middle ground when it comes to him. Verse 30, he says, Whoever is not with me is against me, and whoever does not gather with me scatters. There's a general principle there which we'll come back to, but in context, this is first about the Pharisees. They have refused to align themselves with Jesus. They won't recognize him as God's Spirit-anointed king, and that is not a neutral thing. It's not like the Pharisees are you know, standing at the buffet of options about who Jesus is and saying, oh, we won't have the Messiah option, please, no, like, no salad. It's not just a neutral choice thing. Jesus is saying, no, if you refuse to align with me, you've made the choice to stand against me. And he goes on to outline just how serious this decision is. Verse 31. 
And so I tell you, every kind of sin and slander can be forgiven, but blasphemy against the Spirit will not be forgiven. How do you feel hearing those words? It's a tricky verse, this one. It raises a lot of questions. Jesus is talking about talking here about something which will never be forgiven. And that should sound quite shocking to us. I mean, doesn't the Bible tell us that God is full of mercy and because of Jesus' blood, we'll be cleansed from all sin and if we repent and turn back to Jesus, there's nothing we can't ask his mercy for? That's the kind of thing that verse 31 starts by saying. You know, every kind of sin and slander can be forgiven. Praise God. But, and there's an exception. And as much as it may shock us and unsettle us, Jesus says in no uncertain terms, here is something that will not be forgiven. We need to take this seriously. We need to understand what Jesus is saying. So what is blasphemy against the Spirit? Hearing the word blasphemy, I think the thing that most people normally think of is the way that some people out there might use Jesus' name like a swear word, you know, when you stub your toe or something. And as terrible as a practice as that is, it would seem strange if that was the one unforgivable sin and not murder or genocide or something. No, there's more going on here. The word blasphemy means slandering or cursing. It means to speak against someone. That's how it's elaborated on in verse 32. But what kind of speaking against is Jesus talking about? If we want to make sense of this phrase, we need to understand it's not some just isolated, cryptic little saying. It comes to us in a context. It comes to us as part of Jesus' response to the Pharisees. So what have we seen? Verse 24, the Pharisees said, Jesus drives out demons by the devil. Verse 28, Jesus says, no, I drive out demons by the Holy Spirit. So you put it together, what the Pharisees have done is called the Spirit of God, the devil. They have bad-mouthed God himself and slandered him and mislabeled him to such the extent that they have called the Holy Spirit Satan. And that is no laughing matter. And what's more, we get the sense that that's not just a, an ignorant, naive mistake by the Pharisees. This is a deliberate and willful rejection of God. That seems to be the point of verse 32. Anyone who speaks a word against the Son of Man will be forgiven. But anyone who speaks against the Holy Spirit will not be forgiven, either in this age or in the age to come. The Son of Man is the main title Jesus uses for himself in the Gospels. It's the way that he has presented himself to the world in his ministry. And it seems like Jesus is saying, if, he had, if the Pharisees had spoken against that, if they'd met the man Jesus and mistakenly thought him to be demonic, that would still be a serious and sinful charge, but it would be forgivable. But that's not what the Pharisees have done here. They reject Jesus after seeing him demonstrate his divine authority again and again. Jesus has done countless miracles. He, he's taught with authority. This driving out of the demon in this chapter is just the, the latest and a huge line of demonstrations of who Jesus is. And it's in the face of that clear, repeated, unambiguous evidence that Jesus is the Messiah. It's in the face of that that the Pharisees reject him. More than reject him, they call him evil. So how stubborn must they be? How hardened their hearts towards God that when God's king stands right in front of them, they scowl at him and call him the devil. That is blasphemy against the spirit. Utterly rejecting the spirit-anointed king, knowing full well who he is, and calling him evil instead of good. And Jesus says that is something that will not be forgiven. Not now, not ever. He's saying that people like that are so hardened, so far gone, that there's, there's no longer any possibility that they could realize they have it wrong and turn back to Jesus and plead his mercy. Anyone who turns back to Jesus will be forgiven. But these people are past the point of return. They're past the point of no return. Now, what are we to make of all of that? You know, how would we know today, say, when someone has blasphemed the Holy Spirit? Does there come a point where someone is so hardened to Jesus that we can say now we know they've committed the unforgivable sin, so we might as well stop praying for them and stop sharing Jesus with them because there's no point. Once you can't be forgiven, that, that's it, isn't it? 
I take it that's not the point here. Not least of all, because verse 25, Jesus, it says that Jesus knew their thoughts before he said anything. Jesus knew exactly what was going on in the Pharisees' hearts. He knew the heart that was behind their words because he is the son of God. By contrast, we never really know what's going on in someone else's heart. And as far as we know, from our human point of view, it's always possible that someone's rejection of Jesus may be less serious than this, maybe only temporary. And so we will always keep praying and pleading with everyone until their dying breath to come back to Christ. So if that's not what we're meant to make of this passage, what are we meant to make of it? We need to heed the warning that Jesus has given us here. The warning is, whatever you do, don't follow these Pharisees into this unforgivable sin. Whatever you do, don't become hardened to Jesus to the point that you would turn your back on him and reject him and spit in his face, even though you know exactly who he is. If you know him, then you can't plead ignorance. It might be hard to even imagine how that could happen. I mean, to look at what the Pharisees do, it's quite extreme, right? You wouldn't call Jesus the devil. But perhaps it's a more gradual thing. Perhaps there are warning signs. Maybe it's the, the fleeting desire for, for the pleasures of some sin. You know, God says that thing's wrong, but you really want to do it. And you start to wonder that, if God would deprive me of that, maybe he's really not that good after all. Maybe he is a demon. Maybe it's you still go through the motions of reading the Bible, but you don't really read it. You read it before. You know what it says. You've mastered the word, so you don't let it master you. If you hear words like these and you, and you fear that you are starting to walk down a path that leads to rejecting Jesus, it might be tempting to fixate on that. You know, you can keep looking inwards at your own heart and anxiously wondering, oh, last week, was that it? Was that the moment I blasphemed the Spirit? Is it all over now? Am I beyond the pale? But let me urge you that in these moments, looking inward is only going to make us more self-absorbed and more consumed by guilt, which will only drive us further down the road towards destruction. What we need is not to look inward, but to look upward. Forget yourself and fix your eyes on Jesus. If you are even slightly tempted to think that he is not good, then remind yourself just how good and loving and forgiving he is. That he came to bring in this perfect kingdom of God and do away with evil and, and strike down the devil, even at the cost of his own life, for your sake. So whatever you do, don't turn your back on Jesus. Keep turning back to Jesus. That's the second part of Jesus' response to the Pharisees. The way to respond to him that is unforgivable. Blasphemy against the Spirit. And as Jesus brings this home, he, he broadens the point out of it. Just as the Pharisees' blasphemous words have revealed what the Pharisees really think, so too for all of us. In general, our words reveal the response of our hearts. Jesus makes this point with a common picture he uses often. A tree and its fruit. Verse 33. Make a tree good, and its fruit will be good. Or make a tree bad, and its fruit will be bad. For a tree is recognized by its fruit. Simple enough, right? The, the fruit reflects the tree, the condition of the tree that produced it. When it comes to apples, I don't know about you, but I'm a big pink lady fan. And if you want those sweet, crunchy pink ladies, you don't go looking on the apple tree that's rotten to the core. Like, that's just basic, sound agricultural sense. And in the same way, says Jesus, you don't get good words coming out of evil hearts. That's what he says, verse 34. He calls the Pharisees, you brood of vipers. How can you who are evil say anything good? For the mouth speaks what the heart is full of. A good man brings good things out of the good stored up in him, and an evil man brings evil things out of the evil stored up in him. We have a saying that the eyes are the window to the soul. Well, for Jesus, it's the mouth, which is the window to the soul. Our words speak volumes about what's really going on inside us. So for the Pharisees, their slanderous words against the Spirit revealed the depths of their heart's rejection of Jesus. And so those words they spoke will be the words that condemn them on the day of judgment. But Jesus moves on from them and finishes this section with an invitation for all of us to consider what our words reveal about our hearts. And that's vital because we must give an account for our words. That's what he says, verse 36. 
But I tell you that everyone will have to give account on the day of judgment for every empty word they have spoken. For by your words you will be acquitted, and by your words you will be condemned. Everyone will give an account, you and me included. On the last day, we will all stand before the risen Lord Jesus as our judge, and we will be held accountable for every empty word that has come out of our mouth. And that word translated empty here, it means worthless, unproductive, useless. See, Jesus doesn't just talk about the words which are bad per se, you know, our insults or the unkind things we say that offend people. It's not just those, it's even our mundane, idle chatter, which we'll be held accountable for. You know, our our endless prattle, which can just fill the air. I think of the kinds of things you say, not really meaning to say anything, you know, just to to fill the silence. Nice weather. How about that local sports team? Jesus' words here are sobering, because I certainly find it easy to just dispense words like they're cheap, insignificant things. You just throw them around without even thinking about it. But Jesus says words matter. Words reveal what is in our hearts. And so we ought to consider our words and and pay close attention to what is coming out of our lips. So what what do you think that your words reveal about your heart? Think of the kinds of conversations you have with people, the kinds of things you say. On the day of judgment, what will your words reveal about you? Will there be evidence of a heart that cares for other people because you you showed interest, you, you asked questions, you, you wanted to know how people are really going. Will your words reveal a heart that was more concerned with self-promotion? Will your words reveal a heart that just wanted to stick to the superficial without any real interest in, in people? Will your words reveal a heart that valued comfort and worldly goods above all else? Or will your words reveal a heart that loved Christ I wanted to see the world know his glory more than anything else. In short, will your words reveal a heart that was with Jesus or against him? This passage has shown us different responses to Jesus. We've seen how Jesus responded to them. And now it's time for us to consider what is your response to the king? Because the picture that Jesus paints in this passage is of a world at war. Spiritual war. Jesus came to bring this great clash between the kingdom of Satan and the kingdom of God. And if there's one thing that we cannot do in light of that, it is stand on the sidelines. Because Jesus said we're either with him or against him. And maybe today that you're listening and you consider yourself a fence sitter. You're asking questions about Jesus, but you're not sure yet. You're, you're figuring it out. The jury is still out for you. If that's you, I want you to take to heart Jesus' own words about himself that we've seen tonight. When it comes to Jesus, there is no sitting on the fence. If you think you're sitting on the fence, then you are misguided. Because Jesus says, if you don't run to him and embrace him, then you are against him. And you're on the side with the Pharisees and the demons and the prince of demons himself. And there is no worth, no worse place to be. So come back to Jesus while there is still time. And for those of us who are with Jesus, heed the warnings that Jesus has given us today. Whatever happens, don't let yourself be hardened to him. Pay attention to your words and what they're revealing about the state of your heart. And above all, keep looking to Jesus Thanks be to God that he has come to bring the kingdom of God, to bind Satan, to snatch us back, to be his forever. Praise be to God. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you that Jesus has come to bring your kingdom in, to overthrow the power of the evil one, to set us free from him. And we pray that you would help us always to look to Jesus, to come back to him, not to harden ourselves against him. Help us always to embrace him and the mercy that you have shown us in him. In Jesus' name, amen.
Well, as Jack said, we're going to be singing the song Before the Throne of God Above. Um, the quote he gave was, When Satan tempts me to despair and tells me of the guilt within, upward I look and see him there who made an end of all my sin. Um, we have a, a king and a priest who has taken away our sin and pleads for us in heaven. Um, Nick, Matt, myself and Axel are going to lead us in this song. Um, we need to stay seated and not sing, but I encourage you to hum along um, and reflect on these words as we sing it to you. Thanks, guys. G'day, my name's Mike. It's so good to see so many of you in here. Special shout out to those who are in the breakout room out the back. Give us a wave, guys out the back. Yeah, you know who you are. Nice work. And g'day, everyone at home as well. Uh, I'm going to do something a little bit different. I want to give you 30 seconds just to stand up and stretch and get some oxygen in the lungs. Do you want to stand up and have a quick stretch? If you're at home, you might want to do the same. Uh, but uh, one of the joys of not being able to sing is that we don't stand as much and uh, we want you to not fall asleep or, uh, or whatever.
Now I want you to do 10 burpees before you... No, it's all right. Relax, relax. It's Mike the Strongman. Relax, Mike the Strongman. <laughs> Sorry, brother. Thanks, brother. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I've been throwing under the bus all day. Yeah, here, all so. day. I know. I've been listening all day. <laughs> Friends, uh, we've got some questions. I think we set a world record tonight, Jack. Um, Good on you all. We love yeah, questions. That's fantastic. Questions. Yeah. So um, a million questions on the unforgivable sin. We're just going to ask one, and Jack going to keep elaborating. Mm. Um, uh, if a non-Christian does blaspheme against the Spirit, then later becomes a Christian, can this sin be forgiven? Once our faith is in Christ Jesus, we say that we are cleansed from all sin. Does that not apply to this particular sin? Or is it unforgivable when someone who is already a Christian speaks against the Spirit? Main question, this is still the same person, how does this verse work <laughs> with the <laughs> unlimited forgiveness found in Christ? It's a really good question. Thank you for that. Yeah, it's a, it's a really good question, and lots of people ask it in lots of different ways. So that's just one representative question. So thank you. I think that little first part of the question is a helpful way into the issue. So the question said, if a non-Christian blasphemes against the Holy Spirit and then becomes a Christian, can it be forgiven? And I think that's the issue. I don't think someone can blaspheme the Holy Spirit and then become a Christian. Because the point here seems to be if someone rejects the Spirit-empowered King in this particular way, there is no possibility that they would come back from that and turn to Jesus and be saved. And we hear that and think, how, you know, how does that actually work in practice? And, and that's where it gets hard, I think, as we think about specific instances. Because like I said, we humans, we don't know someone else's heart. We can't really know exactly how profound the rejection that someone has expressed towards Jesus is. And so we keep preaching Christ and hope that someone will repent and God will overcome that. But it means from, I think, from the kind of the God's eye view of the world, if you like, you look at the, the lifetime of these Pharisees and this moment where they had this confrontation of Jesus was the moment where, humanly speaking, they, they went over the edge. And after that point, there was no possibility that they would ever turn back and, and seek forgiveness. So unforgivable sin, I think, is a tricky word. So it's, it's not so much that God doesn't forgive. God's forgiveness is boundless, and anyone who turns to Jesus and asks for forgiveness will be forgiven. There's no one who asks Jesus, oh, please forgive me for the sin, and Jesus says, oh, no, that was unforgivable. You're out. No. Everything we come to Jesus and ask for mercy for, the forgiveness is there. The reason this particular sin will not be forgiven is because those who commit it will never ask. Those who commit it will be so far gone that they will never even turn back to Jesus to ask for forgiveness. Does that help? Does that start to unpack... Where we're going, we can, I can keep going if you well, want. I'm but, um, seeing a couple of nods. I mean, yeah. a couple of people did ask, well, what about mm. um, Saul? Yeah, you know, so Saul who became Paul. murdering Christians. That's right. Became Paul. Exactly, and I take it that means that Paul didn't blaspheme against the Holy Spirit. When you see Pharisees, I think we often think of the Pharisees as just this monolithic group, but like there were stacks of Pharisees. Paul was a Pharisee, but not all the Pharisees rejected Jesus. Like someone like Nicodemus, you see, who's there at the end with Jesus, he becomes a disciple. Paul's sin was grievous. I mean, you know, he's out there killing Christians. Like, that's serious. And yet the wonderful story of Paul is that Saul who became Paul is, even that is forgivable. And that's part of the point, right? Every possible conceivable thing that we do that we ask Christ for, he will forgive us, even someone like Saul. But the person who is so hardened to God that they will not even consider the remotest possibility of turning to Christ, who they know to be God's son, there's no forgiveness possible for that person. Yeah, I think, I think that that is, is what I want to say. If you want to talk more about that, come and chat to me afterwards. There's, there's stacks more to talk about, I'm sure. There'll be a queue a mile long. 1.5. Right. Socially distant keep, keep it, Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> no, thank you, mate. Mm. And we will, God willing, have a crack on the extras. Yeah, for sure. For the 20 other deriv... Uh, mm. Yes. Lots of versions of that, yeah. Awesome. Um, slightly different tack, mate. Mm. Um, how do you balance knowing you are sinful and trusting in God and in Jesus' death. Uh, we should reflect on our own sin. It helps us recognise why we need Jesus. But what's the balance? How do you get the balance right? So the balance between knowing you are sinful and trusting... And knowing that you have... Sorry. And knowing that you have faith, I guess, in Jesus at the same time. Yeah, really good question. I'm glad that you asked it. Um, you don't need to balance them. Those two things are not in conflict. Every one of us is a sinner and you need to trust in Jesus. Being someone who's a sinner doesn't mean that you are not trusting in Jesus. Those two things are not poles apart. 
I think it's possible in an individual heart that they are, like we've seen. For the, those Pharisees, they were sinners, and there was no possibility that they would trust in Jesus. But everyone who trusts in Jesus is still a sinner. Like John says in the first chapter of 1 John, if we claim to be without sin, we deceive ourselves, and his truth is not in us. But if we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Every one of us is a sinner. You can be a sinner and trust in Christ. In fact, if you're a sinner, you must trust in Christ. That's the only way to be forgiven. Yeah, I don't think there's any balancing needed to be done there. You need to hold on to both those things. Never forget that you're a sinner because that's the thing that will lead you to think you don't need Jesus. And never think that you don't need Jesus. Thanks, mate. Thanks, Thanks everyone, for your questions. Really appreciate it. Uh, we have a little bit of family news now. Um, just to kick off, uh, we have the Connect cards that we'd love you to fill out, so you can find that on the website. Uh, as we go through the announcements, uh, that would be a great time to fill that out. It's just a way of letting us know that you were here, uh, of telling us if you would like prayer. Um, maybe if this is your first time, we would love to hear from you, um, or if you're wanting to investigate Jesus more, there's a space for all of that on the Connect card, which is on the website. So. If you'd like to get that out and fill it out, uh, that would be fantastic. Um, toys and Tucker. So uh, we have been uh, doing Toys and Tucker, which is an Anglican care initiative. Um, it's in the name. We are trying to uh, look after people over Christmas uh, by providing toys and food for them. Uh, the cutoff date is this Friday. So if you are planning on bringing in a bag of non-perishable foods or some new toys, uh, this Friday is the last day that you can do that. Uh, so if you want to do that, you can drop it off in the admin block anytime, but not after Friday. Um, we have another announcement now from at PIB. As he comes up, I've got one more. Um, this Saturday, Hamish has his MTS supporters event. So uh, if you would like to support Hamish as he's doing MTS next year, uh, that will be here at the church at 3 p.m. Uh, make sure you stick that in your calendar so that you can uh, be praying for him, you can hear what he's going to be doing, and uh, you can consider supporting him financially as well. Uh, so make sure you put that in your calendar. Um, after Pip, we will have an announcement about the senior minister. <laughs> hey, Brian. Uh, it's four Sundays till Christmas. Doesn't that just blow your mind? Maybe not. It's kind of... everyone. <laughs> You get it. Christmas is coming. Who's got their tree up already? A few people. Good on you. Well done. Um, we love Christmas, obviously. Jesus coming to the world. We want to celebrate Christmas. Uh, but we also want to invite our local community to come and celebrate Christmas with us. We've got some plans uh, cooking for Christmas. And, uh, but we want to get the word out early that we love Christmas. We exist as a church and uh, we're full of people who... Yeah, want to meet people in our community. So uh, Josh Charles has helped us set up a camera in the parents' room up the back. After church, as you're leaving, I would love for as many people as possible just to duck in, and we're going to ask you a question, which is, what does Christmas mean to you? So maybe you want to uh, kind of just rave for 20 seconds and say, you know, why you love Christmas. And we're going to make a compilation video of all those responses and put it out on Facebook and promote it to our local community so that more and more people get a sense of who we are, St Paul's, put some faces to the church and hopefully get lots more people along. So as you go out, please just duck in, uh, speak to the camera for a bit. That'd be great. Thanks. So hi everyone, Justin Lowe's my name. I think I know a lot of you. And if I don't know you, please uh, come and say hello. I'd love to get to know you. I'm um, one of the wardens at St. Paul's. And um, I'm just following up with an announcement to follow up on the email that the wardens sent out on Friday, which I hope a lot of you got, which is um, just with the wonderful news that uh, the Reverend Dr. Raj Gupta has accepted the Archbishop's invitation to become the senior minister here at St. Paul's, which is fantastic news. Uh, Raj currently has been the senior minister at Tungabi Anglican and he's had that role since 2007 and prior to that he was assistant minister at uh, Engadine Anglican and also at Christchurch St Ives. So Raj is married to Nicole and they have three children. 
Uh, Jordan's 19, he's doing medical science, I think, at university. Um, and then Lauren's 17, she's doing the HSC next year. So that's a big move for her as well. Um, and then, um, let's see, I think it's uh, Jordan, yeah, no, the youngest son, Ryan. Ryan's 15 and he's going into year 10. He loves cricket, that guy. Um, yeah, so uh, they're actually going to be, Raj is going to be starting here on Tuesday, 23rd of March next year. So it is a bit of time till they come. Um, obviously, we all want to pull together to pray for them during this transition time. And once we get to meet them, to encourage them, uh, welcome, make them welcome as they come to you know, promote the cause of the gospel here at St. Paul's. Um, the Wardens particularly wanted to thank um, the nominators who did an incredible job over the last six months. It's a really difficult role. Um, so uh, I want to thank Alan Moran, um, our own Rob Binskin, uh, Kath Knudsen, uh, Nicole Hearn and uh, Owen Craig. Uh, we'd also like to acknowledge Dave Kewen for the wonderful job he's done stepping up to uh, fill in as acting minister over this time and it's been a difficult time. So I think we're going to show a video now and then Sam's going to come and pray for the Guptas. Hi, it's in Paul's Carlingford and North Rocks. I'm Raj Gupta. I'm married to Nicole and we have three children. Jordan, he has just commenced university from his bedroom, as I say. Lauren has just commenced year 12 and Ryan year 10. We are so excited to be joining you next year. St Paul's is a church through which the Lord has worked over a sustained period of time in reaching people for the gospel. Many have come to know Christ. Many have been nurtured as Christians. Many people have decided to serve the gospel as lay people, as part -time, in part-time capacities and also in full-time roles. The church's foundation is God's word to us, the Bible, and it is a solidly reformed evangelical church. You guys have pioneered and innovated so much over the years and you have been driven by a desire to reach people with the mystery of Christ as it is revealed to us in God's word. We have been blown away to observe your sacrificial generosity um, uh, across the people of St Paul's in recent years that has facilitated the revamped and expanded facilities. We're so grateful to all who have been involved in the shaping of St Paul's over decades and its continued vision and continued sacrifices to reach even more people who are lost and perishing. There's been the former senior minister, Gary Koo, and before him, Bruce Hall. But you know, really, there have been so many staff and hundreds of lay people who have worked in a variety of teams and given sacrificially over a long period of time, and God has borne wonderful fruit for the gospel. And so with all of this background, it is so humbling to have been asked to join the leadership team at St Paul's. I myself became a Christian as a teenager. I grew up in Balmain where I was introduced to Jesus through the people of a couple of different churches and particularly as people taught scripture in public schools. It helped me connect with a church and I heard the gospel and God then worked in me to embrace the forgiveness that Jesus offers. I became heavily involved in campus Bible study at the University of New South Wales and eventually did an MTS apprenticeship there. And I am just so thankful that God has worked to help me know the priority of the Bible in all of Christian ministry and for the variety of opportunities he's given me through making many mistakes, learning from experience and insight of others and studying at more college and other places. And maybe the Lord has used my own background. I just had this profound biblical conviction that we have been left in this world in no small part to reach those who are lost and perishing. Revelation 21 gives us this incredible glimpse of the future when God himself will be with his people and will be their God. And he will wipe away every tear from their eyes. Death will be no more. Grief, crying and pain will be no more because the previous things have passed away. And so I am excited and humbled to be joining the team at St Paul's and to work alongside you guys to bring the gospel to hundreds of thousands of people who desperately need to hear it. It's been a long year, I know, particularly with COVID. For myself, Nicole and my family, we still need to go through some grief as we say goodbye to the many people at Turngabby who we love so dearly. 
But over the first quarter of next year, we'll be moving house and we'll be finishing up here at Turngabby. And on Tuesday, 23rd of March, will be the commencement of ministry service. And we certainly hope restrictions will be further eased by then. In the meantime, a huge thanks to Dave and the whole staff team and so many others who have all contributed to making church work and continuing to reach people at this time. You guys have been doing an incredible job and we can hardly wait to be with you. Well, that's good news, isn't it? And uh, God has graciously answered our prayers and provided for us. And so uh, I'm going to lead us in prayer, giving thanks to God for this news and uh, praying for Raj and for his family. So will you join me in prayer? Thank you, God, our Heavenly Father, for this news of uh, the appointment of Raj as the senior minister here at St Paul's. Father, we prayed for many months that you would raise up and prepare the right leader for this role, and we thank you for your gracious provision to us through appointing Raj. We particularly want to thank you tonight for the work of our nominators as they led the search for a new minister, and we thank you for sustaining them throughout a long process in a difficult time in the world, and we thank you for their work on our behalf. And we also want to thank you too for Dave Kewen's service over the last 10 months as the acting senior minister. And we pray for Raj and Nicole and their family in this time. We, we want to thank you for saving them. We thank you that they know you and love you. And we especially thank you that Raj has accepted the Archbishop's invitation to join us. And now we pray particularly for Nicole at the moment, that you would comfort and strengthen her in this time of change. We, we ask that you'd help her as she partners with Raj. Would you protect and preserve their marriage through a season of change? Would you help them help stitch them together in oneness? We ask that their love and their marriage would, would overflow um, in blessing to us here at St Paul's. We pray for their kids and, and we pray for Jordan, that you would help him as he studies at university. Pray that he would continue to serve you with his life. Likewise for Lauren, we ask that you would guide and sustain her in faith as she completes her HSC next year. And we ask for Ryan as he moves over to St Paul's and enters year 10 next year and uh, forges new friendships with people here. We ask that you would uh, strengthen him in faith and love of you. And Father, we pray for Raj himself, uh, that you would bless him as he prepares to join us here. We ask that you'd clothe him in righteousness, that you'd prepare him to speak your word to us with boldness and with conviction. We pray that he would lead us here in our work of, of making disciples in ever increasing number to your glory. And we ask, Father, that you would grant us grace as people who will be led by him, we ask that we would be ready to sit under his teaching of your word. We ask that you would use him to grow each one of us into health as disciples and followers of the Lord Jesus Christ. And we ask that through this appointment, you would uh, enable the, the spread and the increase of your kingdom. And we ask all of this through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. Sophie's going to come and lead us in prayer for some other matters. Uh, as Sam said, my name is Sophie, and I'm going to continue leading us in prayer. I'm going to be praying for a few things. I'm going to be praying um, for kids' ministry at St Paul's. I'm going to be praying um, for more college. I'm going to be praying uh, for the aftermath of two typhoons that hit the Philippines last week. Um, and I'm also going to be praying for the friends and family of Sam Hamilton. Um, Sam Hamilton passed away last week, and a few of us here um, know her. And a few of us here were also um, led by Sam at Beagles many years ago, myself included. Um, she was a member at St Paul's for many years, so I'm going to be praying for her friends and family as well. Let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you for your word to us in Matthew tonight. We thank you that you have power over Satan. We thank you that your son, Jesus, has robbed us from Satan, freed us from his power, and triumphed over him. Help us, Lord, to fix our eyes on Jesus. Remind us of his goodness. Remind us of his sacrifice. And remind us of the sure and certain hope we have in him. 
transform our hearts and remove the evil from them and that and may our words and actions bring glory to you lord we pray for the family of sam hamilton after her passing last week we pray particularly for her father who has been by her side through all of her life and her many health struggles we pray that you would comfort him and show him your immeasurable love at this time we also pray for her friends for those who knew her well, that you too would be with them. We thank you, Lord, for the gift she was to many of us. We thank you for the way she faithfully served many of us as kids, teaching us and sharing us from your word. We thank you that she loved you and put her trust in you and is at rest with you now. Lord, we pray um, for all of our kids' ministry leaders. We thank you for their service. We thank you for the hard work that they have been doing over the past year, particularly during the lockdown period. We thank you that these leaders have strived to continue to teach your word to these kids. We thank you that many kids have remained engaged over the year and have returned to kids' programs. We pray that you would sustain the leaders as they finish up the year, particularly as they put the SPK videos together every week um, and all the work that goes along with that. But above all, Lord, we pray that you would continue to save children for your name's sake, that children, no matter how young, would call you Lord. We pray also tonight, Lord, for the Philippines in the aftermath of two typhoons over last week. We pray for all of the work that Compassion is doing for the disaster relief they are providing to families to rebuild their homes, as well as providing hygiene packs. Lord, we pray for the health, particularly for those in the Philippines as the storm has left behind flooding and stagnant water, which has meant an increase in waterborne diseases and mosquitoes that carry those diseases. We pray, Lord, that you would be providing through compassion, that you would bring healing, and that the needs of so many would be met. We pray, Lord, that your beloved children in the Philippines would turn to you and trust in you. Lord, we also thank you for more college, for all the work they've done in training and equipping gospel workers to send out into your harvest field. We pray, Lord, that you would continue to bless more college and the work they are doing. We thank you for Josh Phillips, Winnie Mason, and Joseph Pun, who have left St. Paul's to study at Moore and have now all finished up with their studies. We pray that you would be with all students and faculty of Moore and that the truth of Jesus would be at the center of what Moore College is about. Lord, we pray all of these things because of the sacrifice that your son Jesus has made. So in his name we pray. Amen. Folks, Caleb's about to come up and uh, wrap up our time together. But just uh, before he does that, let me just uh, pop my COVID Marshall hat back on and just remind you that after the service finishes, um, you need to remain seated while you're with us here at church. And so we encourage you to do that chat. Uh, deeply with those around you. There'll also be some chairs outside so you can make your way if you'd like to chat with some people who are not sitting around you, but you do need to be seated at all times. So please just don't mingle in the in the aisles or in the uh, foyer area. Um, stay in your seats, but there will be some extra seats outside as well. Um, thanks so much for the way that you guys have been just uh, helping us by sort of being really um, helpful on that. And I just encourage you to keep it up again tonight. All right. Thank you. Uh, tonight we have heard that there is no grey area when it comes to Jesus, uh, that you are either with him or against him. Uh, there is no in-between. And so one of the first questions to ask tonight is, are you with him or are you against him? Uh, if you are with him, you can be confident that there is forgiveness of sins. Uh, but if you are against him, then death is what you deserve and judgment is still there. Um, one other thing that stood out to me from tonight uh, was uh, down in verse 34. Uh, for the mouth speaks what the heart is full of. Um, I wonder what your mouth speaks. I know that I am slow to share the gospel. And I am fast to speak uh, silly thoughts. I am quick to make inappropriate jokes. I, uh, I speak what my heart is full of, and my heart is not always full of Christ's love. Uh, what is your heart full of, and what does your mouth speak? Uh, we are going to close tonight in prayer, so please join me. 
Our Father, we thank you for Jesus. Uh, we thank you that in him uh, we can have forgiveness of sins. Uh, we thank you that we can be with him, uh, that we are not uh, destined to only be against him. Our Father, we thank you for his grace, for your mercy in him. Our Father, we ask that this week you would help our hearts to be full of the love that he has for us and the love that you have for him. And we ask that our mouths would be quick to speak the gospel in love. And we pray this in the name of Jesus. Amen. Uh, if you are at home, there is no Zoom tonight. Uh, so uh, please talk with the people with you. And as Sam said, uh, maybe good to talk to the people around you and make sure that you stay in your seats. Um, thank you.